I'm sitting here today with Tom McKinney. He is the author of Jack Hinson's One Man War, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about this sensational Civil War biography. So, Tom, thank you for coming in. Um, you are the author of Jack Hinson's One Man War, and, and this, this book presents the story of a really, really unique figure in American history. Tell us, who is Jack Hinson? Jack Hinson was an amazing man who lived on the Kentucky-Tennessee border in an area called, in those days, Between the Rivers, because it was essentially an inland peninsula, about 60 miles long from south to north, and it was bounded on the west by the Tennessee River, on the east by the Cumberland River, and across the north by the Ohio, which was a mile wide. And there were no bridges, so these people were relatively isolated, and uh, like all isolated people, they tended to be self-reliant and uh, accustomed to hardship and hard work and essentially wanted to be left alone. And he lived uh, at the southern end of what was called Between the Rivers. Today it's called the Land Between the Lakes National Recreation Area. And he was a prominent and wealthy plantation owner and businessman. One of the things I learned about him was what a natural, almost uh, uh, genius in terms of business transactions. He, he was not uh, greedy or trying to become a, a, uh, a captain of industry. He was just a natural. And he bought and sold a lot of land, a lot of real estate, lots in the county seat town of Dover, Tennessee. Uh, but primarily, he operated a beautiful large plantation, which was called Bubbling Springs. And when the war came, uh, he wasn't interested like most of the people there, they just wanted to be left alone. But that never works. The war came to him. A major battle was fought there at Fort Donaldson, uh, part of it on his land. And he was uniquely neutral. And I, uh, to illustrate that, during the, the uh, climactic day of the battle, he had a speaking acquaintance with Grant. He also was friends with the Confederate generals, and he went back and forth across the battlefield uh, and gave information to both sides. After the battle ended uh, and the war moved on to the east, the occupation troops moved in behind it, and uh, they seized two of his sons, who were squirrel hunters, and accused them of being bushwhackers, executed them on the roadside with no investigation of any kind, dragged their bodies around the courthouse square in the county seat, cut their heads off, and put their heads on the old man's gate posts, which of course made an instant enemy of him. He quietly set out to get revenge. He had a special rifle made for long range accuracy it's 50 caliber, and we found the rifle. Uh, it it uh, is a typical Kentucky rifle in every way except two. One is the heavy bore, 50 caliber, for long range accuracy, and the other is that it's so plain. Uh, your typical Kentucky rifle was an, uh, an object of pride, of ownership for the, for the man who owned it, and they were typically decorated with uh, shiny brass and shell inlay and that sort of thing. But that rifle is like its owner. It is absolutely strictly for business. There's not a reflective surface on it, which of course is important if you don't want to be seen, but it also, I think, really reflects the, uh, the old man's character. He, by the end of the war, had killed well over a hundred, and he specialized in officers uh, because it was an officer who had his sons executed and cut off their heads. And it was an officer who had established the policy that people suspected, even suspected, of being guerrillas or bushwhackers could be executed on suspicion and uh, not brought in. <clears throat> and uh, he uh, took to the woods. And for the rest of the war, he was a hunted, wanted man, but he was also a terror to the occupying forces and the Union forces moving through the area. He, uh, by the end of the war, the Union had committed elements of nine regiments, both infantry and cavalry, and 
an amphibious task force of Marines, which was in itself a fascinating thing. Uh, uh, they had specially made shallow draft high-speed boats that could carry these Marines already mounted on their horses. And they could run it up on those riverbanks and they come galloping out and go chase the guerrillas that way, uh, reminiscent of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You may remember that where the, uh, the Pinkertons had these special railroad cars made, just like that. Even, even this uh, special, uh, specially trained and specially equipped Brigade of Marines could not uh, get him. They never did. He, uh, he wasn't even, they didn't even come close to capturing this man. And by the end of the war, as I said, he'd killed well over 100. He only claimed 36 because those were the ones that he considered confirmed. If he couldn't walk up to the body and put his foot on it and know that the man was dead, he didn't count them. But for those 36, for each one, he took an eighth inch punch and a little hammer and made a tiny eighth inch circle in the top surface of his octagonal barrel. And they are arranged in a fascinating pattern incidentally, which I cannot explain, unless it is that the, the, the circles that are in a single row were kills that he got in one day. But there'll be three, two, two, one, three, three, one, one, two, all very neatly uh, organized. Uh, and that is his record of confirmed kills. That's extraordinary.